Well, thank you again. I always enjoy coming here. I, I did appreciate, I'll say, a, a bit of a break and uh, top of my normally way overly taxed schedule. One evidence of that overly taxed schedule was, you know, there's a small difference between where the five key is and the six key is. The text for today is actually, because some of you who are more astute notice, isn't that this, about the same passage he used last time? And it's close. But it's actually 2 Corinthians 6, 14 through 18. My mistake, I did it myself. This is, this is masterful. I like this. I have no one else to blame but me, <laughs> which is good. Um, and we'll, we'll, we'll read that through here in a minute. We will, it, will not, it will not escape us. Um, just to recap, because I know this can be a little disjointed as uh, weeks have broken up. Where were we? Of course, I'm kind of doing this series from 2 Corinthians, and I know in the meantime, I've, I've gotten to the point where I've gotten logged on, and I started listening to uh, some of Steve's sermons, some of uh, Jim Lautner's sermon, and then some of Nate's that are online there, and I just never get that far. My life has too many interruptions. Um, we bring ourselves today to bring up an interesting topic. And let me just quick read for you 2 Corinthians 6, verse 14 through uh, 18. It begins, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers, for what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? Or what fellowship has light with darkness? What accord has Christ with Belial? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? What agreement has the temple of God with idols? For we are the temple of the living God, as God, ha God said, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you, and I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. And one of the things we covered last time, and it's not a tragedy that we read it at all. Of course, it's never a tragedy to read scripture. It's good stuff. We covered this ministry of reconciliation, right? As we, the people of God, go out into the world to minister to others, we are there with the purpose of reconciling whoever we encounter back to God. That is our chief and utmost purpose. We're instruments in this. We don't make it happen, but yet that is the mission laid before us. Now some important things I cannot skip as we move into, into chapter 6. Chapter 6 begins, working together with him then, with God, we appeal to you not to receive the grace of God in vain, for he says, in a favorable time I listen to you, in the day of salvation I have helped you, behold now is the favorable time, behold now is the day of salvation. No point in waiting. There's no good excuse. If you think there is a good excuse, move on to 3 verse 5. Paul says, We put no obstacles in anyone's way uh, so that no fault may be found in our ministry. But as, as servants of God, we commend ourselves in every way by a great endurance in afflictions, hardships, calamities, beatings, imprisonments, riots, uh, labors, sleepless nights, and hunger. So the question here is, so what's your excuse? What's my excuse? These guys went through just about everything. Paul, as we read in chapter 1 and 2, he almost despaired of life that things had gotten so bad at times for him. And yet, they carried on. Here, they're presenting in front of the Corinthian church. The apostles are not laying, Paul is not laying impediments, obstacles in front of them. He wants them to move, to be this ministry of reconciliation. Because the day of salvation is now. It's come. Why wait? Why put it off? Don't let these things slow you down. Now, in verse 6, he goes, By purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, and the Holy Spirit, genuine love, by truthful speech, and the power of God, with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and the left. Oh, by the way, verses, um, uh, let's see here, verses 3 through 10 make up one sentence. One sentence, one expressed idea. So Paul is not disappointing us here with his complex use of language. We need to digest it. 
So he's saying we endured all these things by purity, knowledge, patience, kindness, the Holy Spirit, genuine love, truthful speech, and the power of God with the weapons of righteousness for the right hand and for the left. This is a curious little phrase right here. Right? Paul is no stranger to using the military metaphors. Right? And of course, the Roman soldier would have his shield, which they used better than anyone else on the planet at that time and helped them win many, many wars, the Roman soldiers, and of course, the Roman sword in his right. Now, what exactly are we, are we going to the, uh, uh, kind of the fruits of the spirit or the, the armor of the, the Christian? Well, there could be an angle to that too where the, you know, the sword is the word of God. That could be that. But the main point, I think, here in Corinthians is whatever that needs to be, God will provide a defense and an offense to make good use of that, right? Or what portion does a believer share with an unbeliever? Bring you back to his original premise. Now, on a top level, this all makes very intuitive sense, right? And I don't think many of us would disagree. But we live in a day and age where this does not necessarily um, restrain, resist, speak to a lot of people. They don't have much of an issue joining a Christian and a non-Christian. Sometimes that puts us in very awkward positions in life, and it's oftentimes difficult. The rationale cited here, as we get into this, comes in uh, verse 16. So what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And of course, if you have a Hebrew, if you ever know one thing about the Hebrew nation, right, they're the no idols people. They got no special carved images, nothing really representing. I mean, it's interesting as we look at this temple because there's imagery. You build a building, there will be imagery, right? You have architecture. You will have physical manifestation of something. But what do you revere? What do you bow down to? And most, any and all other religions have something you can hold in your hand or something you can kneel before and it's, it's there and it's not necessarily living. It's something created by man. It's something worthless and empty. And yet, particularly even back in Solomon's time and even in Jesus' time, there were lots of temples with lots of idols all around. And they had all sorts of associated bad things that happened with those communities. Paul here says, what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And the answer is, of course, nothing. There's no agreement there. All right, good. For we are the temple of the living God. Now, all those things I just mentioned about the temple being beautiful, being somewhere that people look to find forgiveness, being somewhere that people look to find God, to find forgiveness, the salvation that God has, and to find how goodness flows from our God. That's you and me. Anybody who bears the title Christian, we are that temple. It's one thing to look at in a sense that, yes, God dwells with us, and he does. In a sense, he lives in our hearts. As, our, as the temple in Israel could not contain the vastness of our Lord God, neither can our physical beings but he does dwell with us in a special way. He's near. So when we are in need of that forgiveness, we need not turn towards Jerusalem or some other vast building somewhere. We need not turn to the church of Tucker to find out <laughs> that salvation is possible. Jesus is with us. He knows us. He hears us. We say this in prayer so often. Nathan, you did it this morning too, and it's good because the Lord God knows what's on our hearts, where we've been, what we've been through, what we really need way better than we could even express it to ourselves, much less communicate it to others. But you see, as we are all temples, this does help facilitate this concept we get throughout Scripture too of being a priest to one another, to listening, to caring for one another. But this only works in the world of forgiveness. Now, we covered forgiveness in minute detail a while back. Paul seems to go back and go back and go back to this, so I don't have any reservation going back to it either. Having driven out here, still need forgiveness when I'm driving down. And there's people who need forgiveness as I'm driving down I-20 and 285 and other places. If our sin is always with us, 
forgiveness has to reside with us too. We know we will fall. We know we will falter. Um, in verse 16, he goes on. Um, I will make my dwelling among them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. That comes from actually two different places, and Paul is kind of in, does some interesting paraphrasing here. It's always interesting to see those who biblical inspired writers deal with scripture and citation and utilization. It's always been a fascination to me. So um, that occurs in uh, two places. There's Leviticus 26 verses, uh, it's closer to 13. Let me read 9 through 13 for you. I will turn to you and make you fruitful and multiply. You will confirm my covenant with you. You shall eat old, um, eat old store long kept, and you shall clear out the old to make way for the new. I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you, and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord God, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I have broken the bars of your yoke, and made you walk erect, standing up straight, not as slaves. Israel, of course, were slaves in Egypt. God brought them out. He raised them up, set them in a place, drove out under the hand of David those who were before him, Joshua and David. There's also um, a link here with Ezekiel 26 through 28. Ezekiel is a very interesting book. I'd like to devote more time to it myself. But in Ezekiel, we actually have the passages where we see the Shekinah glory of God leave the temple. A sad day for Israel. They have broken the covenant so many times, so egregiously, so often, that the Lord has seen fit to remove his glory from Israel because he knows there's a better one coming. And believe it or not, that's you and me. But let's move on. Verse 26, I will make a covenant of peace with them. It shall be an everlasting covenant with them, and I will set them in their land and multiply them, and I will set my sanctuary in, the midst, in their midst forevermore. My dwelling place shall be with them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. The nations will know that I am the Lord who sanctifies Israel when my sanctuary is in their midst forevermore. This really looks forward then in Ezekiel here, since the glory is now gone, to what's going to happen in Acts. That glory is going to return to the temple of the Christian, of those being prepared for service in the Lord. It'll be in our midst, really, in our midst, in ourselves. What an amazing thing. Verse 17. Therefore go out from their midst and be separate from them, says the Lord, and touch no unclean thing. Then I will welcome you. This actually is a paraphrase of Isaiah 52, um, starting at verse 9. Break forth together in singing, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has uh, barred his holy, has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Depart, depart, go out from there. Touch no unclean thing. Go out from their midst of her. Purify yourselves, you who bear the vessels of the Lord, for you shall not go out in haste. You shall not go out in flight, for the Lord will go before you, and the God of Israel will be your rear guard. God still watches and protects his people. As we look back at 17 then, to try to understand how Paul is using this in its context. He is trying to convince, declare that the Corinthian people should remain faithful, should remain pure to try to separate themselves from those unclean things of the world. But the reality is, how do we separate ourselves as Christians from things that are unclean? And the answer is, as we learn throughout Scripture, is only by God's removal of that sin from us. Many people have tried to live in captivity away from the world, trying to keep that community pure, but sin still 
reigns, even in those very set-apart communities. The way we stay set apart is in God's forgiveness, in his love and in his protection in that. As Solomon admits, Paul admits, Jesus testifies, we will fall and we will falter. We're separated by that forgiveness we have in Christ, right? Then in verse 18, and I will be a father to you and you shall be sons and daughters to me says the Lord Almighty. This is an interesting paraphrase from 2 Samuel 7, where it says, He shall build a house for my name, speaking of David, and I will establish the throne, or sorry, David's son, Solomon, throne of his kingdom forever, and I will be to him a father, and he shall be a, uh, to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men and with the stripes of the sons of men, but my steadfast love will not depart from him as I took it from Saul when I put away uh, when I put away from before you, or whom I put away from before you. This is about Solomon. We know Solomon doesn't maintain the best level of integrity throughout his life. At the end of his life, it's really even questionable whether he still has any faith left or not. But yet the Lord declares his faithfulness to him even through those very low times. And that we know through this line comes the Christ, the one who bears the title of king forever and ever. And in response to this, then King David went and sat before the Lord and said, Who am I, O Lord God, and what is my house that you have brought me thus far? And yet this was a small thing in your eyes, O Lord God. You have spoken also of your servant's house, for a great while to come, and this is instruction for mankind, O Lord God. David responds with a heart of deep gratitude. This man, after God's own heart, knows what God has in store for his family line, really for history, for the glory of God, and sees, even with all David's been through, the promise that he would be king, he is now king, and that his son would continue in his dynasty, David is humbled by what God has done for him and in gratitude expresses his love for God. So as we think about bearing this title of temple, we are all temples of the living God. Jesus lives amongst us. People look to us for forgiveness. They look to us often for guidance. And we look to the spirit inside the God who dwells with us for our own help day by day. And others outside look in and say, who are these people? What do they have? How can I get part of that? How can I be included in this? And that we serve as witnesses to the world as our temple. And realistically, the more we realize this, the more we are grateful for what God has done and how he has blessed us. And it's always difficult because we are strictly in the vein that we are saved by faith alone. But human nature wants to creep in and go, but you've got to kind of do this and you've got to kind of do that and you've got to do that. We will fall every time we set up a rule. But the reality is, if our good works come out of our gratitude for what God has done for us, then they cannot go wrong. They don't do anything to help our standing with God. But yet those good works then serve as adornments on our temples that people look at us and say, there's the forgiving people and there's just something about them I've got to have. Let us pray together. Almighty God and everlasting Father, Lord, you have blessed us with the responsibility of being your temple. And Lord, we know this will not Last forever for one you come again, we will be directly in your presence, in your house. And your light, in your glory will show all around. And we will bask in your glory and we anxiously await that day. But Lord, as we tarry on the road 
to that day. Help us to help others to see your glory. Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.